go. There we go, Scotty Roberts. There we go. <clears throat> You can always hear Scott typing away, the little click on the keyboard. Yes. <clears throat> That's just a recording. <laughs> well, I, I'm impressed. That's right. It makes people think I'm busy. I have like stacks of papers, spreadsheets, and stuff like that. <laughs> Screensaver is just a giant, massive screen, spreadsheet, you know, with all these numbers on it. Uh, Looks pretty I guess, good. Huh? I have props that look like I've just got mountains of work, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really asleep, but on my eyelids, eyelids I've had tattooed open eyeballs. You know? <laughs> I don't buy that one for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I like the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got Dusty Haskins watching on YouTube. Hey, Dusty. Mm. And the dad frequency, yellow. <laughs> and osmos, osmosis 007. I like the 007 part, you know, because I'm a big Bond fan for sure. Howdy, Internet peoples. Now, it, guys, is there going to be another Bond film? Does anyone know? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, after watching the place where he was standing explode, you know, in the last movie. Uh, spoiler alert, guys. Okay, if you haven't seen the last Bond film. Uh, <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> yeah, it's out. <laughs> Too, I mean, you see this ending and you go, well, that's the end of James Bond, you know. Anyways. Well, James Bond part two, they do... Yeah, they bring a lot of stuff back. Yeah, maybe they got a young James Bond. They go back to when he was a boy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then we can see all the episodes and adventures that they never showed us before, right? <laughs> yeah. Before he dies. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Anyways. Good to be back on with Astronomical League live. And yeah, all the me too. Here. Me yeah, too. we're glad we're glad you're both here. Yeah. Yeah, it's it seems like it's been a long time. I, well, probably the beginning of December, I think, was the last one we did. Yeah. That is a long time. Dad Frequency wants to know: Wasn't there a rumor of a female Bond coming up? Hmm. New Bond movies are a universal content, constant every decade or so. Well, we need a Bond, a James Bond that's interested in astronomy. Yeah, that'll work. Right? Astro Bond. Astro Bond. Exactly. Astro Bond. <laughs> what is NGC 007? What is that? Oh, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah. That's... That's going to be a contest answer, I think, right? There we you go. 007. They need a little car like the Jetsons have. Maybe they don't have an what? NGC 007. There's just an NGC 7. You can stick a couple of zeros in front of it, I guess. <laughs> Steven, is there a 007 anywhere? Steven Prabhu is uh, watching on Facebook. Thank you for tuning in. Sculptor Galaxy. Sculptor. It's in Sculptor. <clears throat> what a cool galaxy. <clears throat> James Bond is almost as cool as that galaxy is. <laughs> almost. Well, we know what he wants for Christmas, a James Bond shirt. That's mm. right. I want a James Bond shirt of James Bond looking through a telescope. That's what I want. Maybe you can write your own show there. Maybe. Yeah. I doubt it. Oh, I bet you could. Nobody might pay any attention. Well, I can write it. That's for sure. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> Whether they use it in the script, that's another story. Well, yeah, well. That's another story. 
Well, thanks to everybody that's uh, tuning in. Astronomers using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope have recorded a star's final moments in detail as it was ripped apart and eaten up by a black hole in a tidal disruption event. The shredded star is nearly 300 million light years away, but astronomers used Hubble's powerful ultraviolet sensitivity to analyze its light to gather forensic clues of the violent event. <clears throat> Hubble data found a very bright, hot, donut-shaped area of gas the size of the solar system swirling around a black hole. The swirling gas was once a star. Usually, astronomers get just a few observations at the beginning of a disruption event. It's very bright, but this energetic collision's proximity and brightness allowed Hubble to gather ultraviolet data over a longer than normal time period. This is a rare opportunity for scientists to create models of what they think is going on and then compare those models with what Hubble sees. It is an exciting place for scientists to be right at the intersection of the known and the unknown. <clears throat> wow, it's been a long time, as Terry said, since we've done an Astronomical League live program, um, but uh, uh, here we are on our 24th episode, and we've got uh, Terry Mann with us, who will introduce our guests. Terry, it's great to have you back on to uh, uh, the Explore Alliance and to run this uh, Astronomical League live program. Uh, we know that thousands and thousands of people have watched these uh, uh, presentations, and you've had, when I think about it over the last year or so, uh, you've had some amazing speakers on including uh, your amazing speaker today, so. Yes, yep, definitely. We have been very fortunate. I think that's one of the good things that comes out of using Zoom is we could reach so much farther to, to you know, we, we would never experience some of the speakers we've seen at Alcon when we did virtual or on some of these programs that are online. Uh, it really opens up the whole world to learn about other things going on in astronomy and other places. So as Scott said, thank you all for being here. We really do appreciate it. It does seem like it's been a long time, um, I guess because it was the beginning of December on the last program. And we will be doing another one on February 10th. So uh, make Very sure, good. sure you put that on your calendar. Uh, we'd love to see you come back. So let's start off tonight with David Levy. David, it sure is good to see you too. I haven't seen you in forever either. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while, yeah. Terry. Thank you for putting me on tonight. It's well, thank you for being here. Be. Thank you. It's it's wonderful to be back with you, my friends of the Astronomical League. I am looking very much forward to the um, convention this summer in Louisiana. I hope to be there to give a lecture and to autograph my new book. It's called Clipper Cosmos and Children, Finding the Eureka Moment. And I don't know if I have a copy. I don't think I have a copy of it. So uh, you'll just have to imagine it. Um, anyway, if you don't want to wait till the convention to get an autographed copy, you can get it right now, this minute today, on Amazon.com. You log into Amazon, go to Books, and then search for Clipper Comma Cosmos. And the book should come right up and you should be able to get it. It's the, I think it sells for $20 on Amazon. Anyway, um, I am I usually come on right away so that I can give a quotation. And I know it's really no longer fall anymore. We're well into winter. But uh, today's poem is going to be from John Keats, his Ode to Autumn. And he wrote it in, on September the 19th, 1819, which turns out to be my parents' anniversary day. <clears throat> and also just a couple of years before he died and succumbed from tuberculosis. Where are the songs of spring? Aye, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too. 
while barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Then in a willful choir, the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives or dies, and full grown lambs loud bleep from hilly born. Head crickets sing, and now with treble soft, the red best breast whistles from a garden craft and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Thank you very much. And back to you, Terry. Thank you, David. That's beautiful. We really appreciate that. Thank and you. hopefully, uh, hopefully we will see you out in Baton Rouge too at the end of July. I believe it's uh, July 26th through 29th, Carol, I think. That's I think it's the week before that. <laughs> I'll bring it up here in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. And I, well, the whole gang's going to be there. So please, everybody join us that can. It, I'm pretty sure it is the end of July. Yeah. it's You're, you're right. Yeah. Good. 26th through 28th, I believe. Yeah. And uh, if we have council members watching, that'll be on the 25th. It'll be the day before the conference starts. So. Thank you again, David. Uh, Chuck, let's go to you. How about if you give everybody an update on what deadlines are coming up on what awards? Thank you, Terry. Um, we have in the Astronomical League a entire group of awards for youth members and non-members in some cases, and also general league awards that are available to anyone. Uh, the deadlines for all of these awards this year are March 31st, so not hard to remember the deadlines. Uh, among the awards for youth are the National Young Astronomer Award, which is sponsored by Scott Roberts and Explore Scientific uh, very generously. He sponsored this for uh, several decades now and uh, uh, is a critical element in our uh, ability to recognize young high school age students who do research in astronomy, which is what that award is primarily about. We also have a service award, two major service awards, the Horkheimer Smith and Horkheimer Daria um, awards, which provide large cash prizes. And in the case of the Smith Award, a trip to the national convention. Uh, we have an imaging award, the Horkheimer Parker Imaging Award, which provides cash prizes uh, to its winners. Uh, $1,000 for the first place award. And we have the Horkheimer O'Meara Journalism Award, which is open to eight to 14 year olds who write essays. And that too has a $1,000 first prize. And all of these of course come with plaques. Uh, our general awards include uh, uh, league members who are webmasters for their clubs or who write uh, the newsletters, edit the newsletters for their clubs. Uh, that would be the Mabel Stearns Award. We have a sketching award uh, each year, and we also have a uh, Wilhelmina Fleming uh, imaging award that is available to uh, female league members. Um, and all of the details about these awards and how to nominate someone for them or apply for them can be found on the Astronomical League website at www.astroleague.org. Uh, just uh, look down the menu on the left side for the word awards and you'll find information that will lead you to links that uh, have uh, application forms and so forth and nomination forms. Again, the deadline is March 31st. I would say if you're interested in these awards, please note the little comment uh, on the awards uh, page that says that we need uh, for you to receive a confirming email that uh, we have received your nomination because sometimes about once every couple of years, one of these uh, nominations will go to spam. And uh, we do have a backup system to prevent that from happening. Uh, more than one person receives submissions. Um, mm -hmm. But just in case, uh, be sure to look for a confirming email. March 31st, the deadline for these awards. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Chuck. It's hard to believe they're rolling around again. It seems like it was just a few days ago we were giving them away in Albuquerque. So thank you. Okay, uh, how about if we go to Carol? Carol, what's going on and with the league? Well, uh, quite a bit on lots of fronts, behind the scenes at least, trying to get ready, uh, getting uh, Alcon 2023 in place. And to uh, uh, talk briefly uh, beyond uh, the... Uh, uh, observing awards and so on, or the special youth awards, 
one thing for master observers who have never received your master observer plaque. We'll be doing that again at, at uh, Baton Rouge. So if you have a, uh, if you've never received your plaque for being a master observer, uh, stay tuned. It'll be out there publicized on the website very soon. But we need, we would really like to honor you for all the hard work you've done on that award. The other thing is, uh, hopefully everyone's getting out and enjoying the new comet. Uh, you're going to have to do it this time around because it's, uh, I forget what, 5,000 years or something. It may be even beyond that <laughs> before it's back. So I think we better take advantage <laughs> of this opportunity. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, Baton Rouge is coming on nice, as I was uh, saying earlier. Uh, there's lots of great speakers coming, uh, and uh, Dr. Levy will be there as one of our featured speakers, Dave Acker, uh, as well as Fred Espinak, as among other speakers as well. So uh, be prepared. About the end of February, we're estimating registration will be on the website, so stay tuned. Terry, that's all for right now. Back to you. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see, Chuck, I am going to go to you. How soon can you be ready to do your talk? Or are you already ready? About five microseconds from now. I think I can kill enough time <laughs> there for you to get ready. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, tonight, Chuck Allen will be giving a talk titled the, the, the Deep Universe. Now, he's going to speak about the factors that limit how far we can see, namely the speed of light, and the age and expansion of the universe. He'll take us on a review of the furthest objects ever detected using the Hubble Space Telescope and discuss how much deeper and more clearly we have been able to peer into space using the James Webb Telescope. New discoveries, new problems are generated, are solved, I'm sorry, by the JWST Finally, he will explain some of the big questions that astrophysicists have tried to answer about the size and the nature of the universe beyond our horizons. Now, Chuck has been an amateur astronomer since the age of seven <clears throat> and a lecturer of over 500 audiences since the age of 12. He is also a past president of the Astronomical League and the current vice president. He's the founder of the League's National Young Astronomer Award he founded that in 1993 and is the recipient of the League's GR Wright Service Award. He is a League certified gold level master observer. If you ever want to know anything, ask Chuck. He will know it. He has completed 42 League observing programs and coordinates three of them. He is a former international science and engineering fair judge and a lead lead, blah, lead judge and has been a, and had a lifelong friendship and association with Princeton University astrophysicist and author J. Richard Gott since the age of 11. Wow, that is a great friendship when you can keep up with each other for that length of time. Chuck, thank you for everything you do for the league, for everything you do to help everybody else. And thanks for sharing your knowledge. We all really appreciate it. So Chuck, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Terry. Well, my time's up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> good evening. It was a great talk, it really was. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. Good evening. Amazing. Good evening, everyone. And um, I'd like to start this out by telling you something that's always interested me a great deal. And that has to do with extremes. Uh, when I traveled a long road trip with Richard back in 1967, one of the features of the trip that we didn't expect was finding the world's tallest structure, a radio mast in uh, North Dakota. Um, things like that have always fascinated me. And uh, I've always been very fascinated with tall mountains and extremes in astronomy as well especially galaxies and quasars, and even searching for distant objects in our solar system like Pluto. Um, in fact, the faint fuzzies fascinate me enough that I've seen 1900 different galaxies at this point in my observing career. And I just love hunting them down. It's a lot of fun. And astronomers love it too. Professional astronomers love to peer deeper and deeper back in time, which is of course the only thing we can do, 
uh, because the further back in time they look, the more they learn about the early universe and the more they learn about how it probably got started. So the questions we want to look at tonight are three, basically. Number one, how deep have you peered into the universe? Um, and how deep might you peer? Uh, how far have astronomers probed into the universe? And how deeply will we be able to probe in the future with uh, telescopes like the James Webb? So let me share screen and we'll get started here. Okay, does that look okay to everyone? Yeah. Okay, great. Very nice. All right. So the first thing I guess we'd like to start with is just how far might you see without any optical aid at all? If you go outside on a good dark night and you have vision that's capable of doing it, you can observe the furthest star that's visible to the naked eye. And that star is V762 in Cassiopeia. It shines at magnitude plus 5.8. It's a little tricky to find, and it's not bright. You'll need a good dark night. But when you see it, you'll be seeing a star whose light left there 16,308 years ago. Um, and that's about 95 quadrillion miles away. Uh, now, this is not the furthest star that has ever been seen, naked eye, and uh, I'll show you that record. And it happened back in 1885 when a supernova appeared in what was then referred to as the Andromeda Spiral Nebula. Back in the 1800s, we didn't know about other galaxies. We thought our galaxy was it, and that the spiral nebulae that we now know are other galaxies were just perhaps solar systems forming within our own galaxy. But people saw this supernova that erupted in M31. It rose to magnitude 5.8, and it's uh, gradually over a period of six months faded to magnitude 14. But again, no one knew at the time that what they were seeing was a star that was actually a supernova 2.6 million light years away. Well, what's the furthest object that we might see with the naked eye on a regular basis? That is not something that's temporary, but a relatively permanent object that we might observe. It's generally believed to be NGC 5128. This is a radio galaxy known better perhaps as Centaurus A. Obviously it's in the constellation of Centaurus, which makes it kind of low on the horizon for people in mid latitudes in the US. But if you're in the South, far South of the US, uh, or indeed in the Southern Hemisphere or anywhere in the equatorial regions, you can get a good dark night and see this object uh, without any optical aid at all. It's a toughie at magnitude plus 6.8. But when you see it, you'll be observing something that's 13 million mm. light years away. Uh, amazingly enough, even it is not the furthest mm. thing that anyone could have observed naked eye. And I want you to remember that because I'm going to revisit that in a few minutes. With small telescopes, of course, you can begin to explore the universe much more deeply. With even a modest uh, telescope of just a few inches aperture, you can observe the great Virgo cluster at 54 million light years. It's full of Messier objects that are quite bright and indeed visible to binoculars. Um, and this is the hub of our local supercluster, of course. It's about 1,300 galaxies consisting of more than a quadrillion stars. And it's the gravitational hub of our local Virgo supercluster of galaxies. If we back away from the Virgo cluster a little bit, we find ourselves here, and we find the Virgo cluster here, 54 million light years away, and we find a whole bunch of other clouds of galaxies that form a, a giant body that we refer to as Laniakea. That means immeasurable heaven, except, uh, well, we have measured it. It's about 250 million light years across. And with an amateur telescope of modest size, maybe eight or 10 inches, you can observe galaxies in the Fornax cluster down here, uh, the NGC 7329 group over here, many of the galaxies in the Virgo cluster, obviously not all of them, just the brighter ones, but nonetheless, it's accessible to people with small telescopes. But you can see even further with amateur instruments, a lot further. Back in 1963, a Dutch astronomer by the name of Martin Schmidt 
uh, became interested in the star that is pointed to in this arrow. It's in the constellation of Virgo. It's magnitude plus 12.9. And he was very baffled by its spectrum. Here's a normal stellar spectrum down here at the bottom. And at the top here was the spectrum from this star. It didn't match anything he had ever seen before. The more he studied it, suddenly he realized what he was seeing. He was seeing the hydrogen delta, gamma, and beta lines shifted far into the red. And the oxygen three doublet line here shifted way into the red in the spectrum. Now we knew that the distance an object is away from us uh, increases the rate at which the expansion of the universe carries it away and it stretches the light more. So the further an object is away, the redder it looks, the redder the light gets by the time it reaches us. And so that correlation told him that what he was actually seeing was an object that was 2.4 billion light years away. Now this is an object that can easily be seen in an eight inch telescope, maybe smaller on a good night. And yet it's two, over 2 billion light years away. It's actually a quasar, a quasi-stellar object. It is the core of a brand new galaxy whose black central black hole is accreting material and releasing enormous amounts of energy that we see. Uh, that also has the effect of creating a jet of something called synchrotron radiation. And you can see the jet emanating from this mm. quasar here. This is just the core of the galaxy. The actual galaxy is fairly large in comparison with this image, but that star, that quasar, if you will, it's not a star, uh, can be seen at over 2 billion light years with a very small telescope indeed. What you'll be doing is looking past this giant cluster of galaxies, the supercluster we call Laniakea, all the way across a huge swath of the cosmic web, which are streams of galaxies mm. at a quasar in a galaxy that far away. Again, accessible in small amateur instruments. <clears throat> if we moved 3C273, this quasar in Virgo, if we moved it to the distance of Arcturus, a bright star you see in the constellation of Boötes, it would shine equally with the sun, even though it would be 2 million times further away than the sun. That's how bright, how luminous this object is. It has a luminosity of 4 trillion suns. Now in 1912, a fellow by the name of Albert Einstein predicted that galaxies and massive objects in space would cause curvature of space. And this might allow for objects further away to have their light lensed around these foreground objects, creating multiple images or even arcs that we would see. Again, he predicted that in 1912. It was not until 1979 that this twin quasar, QSO 0957 plus 561, was discovered in Ursa Major. And what you're seeing here is one quasar with two blue images here. The spectra are absolutely identical. It's the same quasar. But we're seeing two images of it because the light coming from this quasar is passing around this foreground galaxy that you see here and then being refocused at us. And so we see it brighter than it might look otherwise, and we see two images in this case. Um, in the 1980s, uh, we discovered the arcs that were predicted. You see here these strange arcs, which are really images of galaxies that are in the background behind this huge galaxy cluster that we call Abel 370. Abel 370 is in the constellation of Cetus, and it lies at a distance of 5 billion light years. And the little arcs you see all over here, these are galaxies that are further away on the other side of the cluster. And their light is being bent around the foreground cluster, creating these arcs. Um, I want you to remember this slide when I refer to Abel 370 and the ring arcs that you see in this picture, because there's something hiding way behind this, and it'll come up about 20 years later and a few minutes from now in this talk. With a very large telescope in Chile in 2011, an object called El Gordo was detected. This is an object at 7 billion light years in space. It's actually two galaxy clusters that are colliding at over a million miles per hour. There are about three quadrillion stars involved in this collision. Now, remember I said that there was a star even further 
than the supernova that appeared in the Andromeda galaxy back in 1885 that could have been seen naked eye. There's no record of anyone seeing it naked eye, but it could have been. And what an event that would have been if you had. It was what we call a gamma ray burst, more than likely a super uh, massive star becoming a black hole in a supernova explosion and releasing an enormous burst of gamma rays. This particular burst occurred on March 19th, 2008, just a few years back. And it rose to magnitude 5.5 and stayed at above magnitude six for about a minute. And had you been looking right in that direction with the unaided eye, you might have on a good night seen this little magnitude 5.5 star appear and then disappear a minute later. And what you would have been seeing is light that had traveled to you for 7.5 billion years. It wow. covered 7.5 billion light years to get to your eye. This event, by the way, occurred just hours after Arthur C. Clarke died. And so this is referred to as the Clark event as a result of that. Now, you'd think at more than 7.5 billion light years, we'd be well out of the realm of amateur telescopes. But man, you'd be wrong. Here is one of my favorite objects in space, PGC 1634 plus 705. This is another quasar, just like the one in Virgo that we talked about a few moments ago. But it's very easy to find. With a 10-inch telescope on a good night, or maybe larger, uh, possibly an 8 on a very good night, it, you'll be able to see this. First of all, you just find this little triangle right here. It's got two eighth magnitude stars. They're very prominent. It's a very interesting little asterism. And right next to it is a triangle, almost a perfect isosceles triangle with 11th, 12th, and 13th magnitude stars. And right off the southeast side is a little arc of three specks. Now, these are faint enough that in a 10 or 12 inch telescope, if you look right at them, they'll probably wink out, but glance just a little to the side and you'll see them easily. And this one right here is a quasar whose light has taken 9.5 billion years to reach your eye. Wow. Now, during the time that that light was traveling to your telescope, the galaxy was receding even further. And today, in whatever form it has today, it lies at nearly 13 billion light years away. Now, keep in mind, when you're talking about seeing light that's traveled to you for nine and a half billion years, that the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. So you're seeing some old stuff here with a small telescope. Now, many amateurs have access, and even those of you who merely attend public events run by astronomy societies will have access to 20-inch Dobsonian telescopes. And with a 20-inch and possibly an 18 on a good night, maybe even smaller on an exceptional night, you might be able to detect optically, looking through an eyepiece, a heavily reddened little speck that shines at magnitude 15.2 uh, in the constellation of Lynx. And that uh, reference to Draco is an error. Now, this object is shining at you from a distance of 12.05 billion light years. That is to say, when you see it, you will be seeing light that has traveled to you for almost the entire age of the universe. You are looking back in time to a point in time when the universe was less than 2 billion years old. Today, in whatever form that uh, quasar has today, the galaxy that it used to be in the center of uh, is to almost 24 billion light years away. Now, one of the reasons we can see it is because it's just incredibly bright. Its energy output is equal to a quadrillion suns. Uh, another reason we can see it is because there's a foreground cluster of galaxies that are causing a gravitational lensing effect that's magnifying it. In fact, the Chandra telescope finally imaged the fact that what we're really seeing in APM 08279 plus 5255 is uh, a lensed image of the quasar, so we see actually two images of it. Uh, this is a quasar that is powered by a 20 billion solar mass black hole. And it's one of the most interesting places in the universe because it's the largest known repository of water in the entire universe that we've detected so far. In fact, uh, the amount of water vapor detected in this quasar is 140 trillion times the entire ocean content 
of the water on the Earth. And it's all pouring down the drain of a black hole. And here we'd be ostracized for using five gallon flush toilets. Nonetheless, if we brought APM, if we brought this quasar to the distance of the star Arcturus, 33 light years away, it would shine at magnitude minus 4.45, minus 45. That's 16 million times brighter than the sun looks in the sky. I would suggest to you that that would be suboptimal. Now, you remember a little while ago, we talked about that Abel 370 cluster that had the ring arcs, the gravitationally lensed galaxies that made arcs. And I told you that something lurked way in the background, and indeed it did. It's a galaxy called HCM6A, and it was discovered in 2002. And uh, it was determined by its redshift to lie at a light travel distance of 12.8 billion light years, uh, which set the record at the time in 2002 as the furthest object that we had ever detected in space. Now, just as an aside, we'll just leave this record where it's lying right now at 12.8 billion light years. But just as an aside, you'd think that only quasars and galaxies could be seen at such enormous distances that we're talking about now. But that's not really true, because just last year, astronomers uh, detected a heavily lensed galaxy. Here you see the ring arc much like those that were seen around Abel 370. And in that ring arc, they detected a single speck that had a very discrete stellar spectrum. It's the furthest star ever detected, the furthest single star. The only reason we're seeing it is because the gravitational lens created by these foreground galaxies here has magnified its image 40,000 times. This star is called Arendelle. It lies at a distance, a light travel distance of 12.9 billion light years. Today, of course, the star has been extinct for over 12 billion years and whatever is left over from it, it lies at a distance of 28 billion light years from us. Now the record that was held by this galaxy that I showed you a minute ago, whoops, sorry. Let me go back. Ah. Hold on just a second, folks. Sorry about that. When I showed you this galaxy here, the one that we detected behind uh, Abel 370 and whose light took 300, or excuse me, whose light is coming from 12.8 uh, billion light years, that record stood uh, <clears throat> until the year 2012. And in 2012, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope imaged a galaxy called MACS 1149JD1. Now, this galaxy shines at a uh, very faint magnitude, just plus 27, uh, which is extraordinarily faint. Um, but it had a redshift that indicated that the light had been traveling to us for 13.28 billion light years. Uh, years. That means that its light has traveled 13.28 billion light years. Um, today, this galaxy in whatever form it has today um, uh, lies at a distance of over 30 billion light years. Now, this record lasted for three years until the Hubble Space Telescope imaged another little proto-galaxy looking back in time called GNZ11. This was detected in 2015 in the Hubble Deep Field. And it's a little proto galaxy. It just has about a billion stars in it. It's only about 1 25th the size of the Milky Way. And this is what we expect to find when we look so far back in time that we're just looking at the point where the gas was beginning to coalesce to form stars after the Big Bang. There's a period before that when all there was was dark gas that we couldn't see at all. It took a while, several hundred million years for stars to begin to form and then glom together to form little proto-galaxies like GNZ11. Now, this was determined to have a light travel distance to us of 13.4 billion light years. That means that we're now seeing an object as it was just 400 million years uh, after the Big Bang, right in that era when stars were starting to form. This record lasted for seven years. 
until uh, in April of last year, 2022, the Subaru telescope detected this little red smudge. You can barely see it in the actual photo. It's been enlarged here uh, greatly. I'll give you an even better view of it here. And what you're seeing here is the galaxy called HD1. It's another proto galaxy. It lies uh, at a light travel distance to us of 13.44 billion years. Now, again, let me emphasize the universe is 13.8 billion years old. This light's been traveling to us for 13.4 of those 13.8 billion years. <clears throat> now, this record lasted just three months. Now, I want you to keep in mind the distance, 13.44 billion light years, because now we have the James Webb coming into play. And it detected in uh, the constellation of Sculptor this past July, a galaxy called Glass Z13. It's only 1600 light years across. Here it is here. And you see it enlarged in this image right here. Uh, and its distance was determined from its redshift to be 13.47 billion light years. And that record lasted just two months. And two months later, in September of 2022, a constellation uh, in the constellation of Fornax, the James Webb detected Jade's GSZ 13.0. It's this little red smudge that you see right here. The distance, based on its redshift, was determined to be 13.525 billion <clears throat> light years. Now that's the distance the light has traveled. The galaxy itself is now 33 billion light years away because the whole time the light was traveling to us, the universe was expanding. And this record, which was not fully confirmed yet before something even further was found, uh, and that was Sears 93316 in Boötes. This was announced in October of 2022, just a few months ago. It has an incredible redshift. Its light has been stretched because it's been passing through expanding space for so long that uh, its estimated distance, light travel distance, is 13.6 billion light years. Uh, it's a distance today, something in the order of 35 billion light years. That's where, in whatever form it has today, it would be. Now, this is the current record. It's not yet confirmed. There are some people who question its distance because it seems so extraordinary that we would be able to see a proto-galaxy as it was just 200 million years. That's two tenths of a billion years after the Big Bang. It was thought it would take the gas a little bit longer to begin coalescing to form uh, little proto galaxies like this. Now notice that the James Webb Space Telescope increased the distance record by only 0 0.16 billion light years from 13.44 to 13.6. And 13.6 hasn't been fully confirmed yet. Uh, spectroscopic work is being done to confirm it. So should we expect to see much further? What if we put another space telescope in space with a mirror a mile across? Would we be able to see vastly further than this? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is that <clears throat> lights only had the age of the universe to reach us and no light was shining until about 200 million years after the Big Bang. So we're going to increase the record by inches, the purpose of telescopes like the James Webb is not to see much further, but to see better the nature of the objects that we're looking at. And wow, has it accomplished that. Now, just to make very clear what's going on here, you take one of these galaxies like HD1. When the light left HD1, the galaxy was about a billion light years away from us and the universe was much smaller. But because the universe was expanding, the light ended up having to travel 13.5 billion years to reach us. And today, while that expansion was taking place, the galaxy's out here at 35 billion light years. And so we can't see much further than light travel distances of 13.5 or 13.6 because we will be looking back into an era so far back in time that stars haven't formed yet. So there are those limits. But what about these huge redshifts that we're observing in objects like the Sears galaxy I showed you a moment ago, which currently holds the record if confirmed? Well, 
There are a couple of problems that astronomers are puzzled and bothered by. One of them is that the James Webb has now found a whole bunch of well-developed barred spiral galaxies, some of which have light travel distances of 11 billion light years. No one thought that mature galaxies of this type could form quite that fast after the Big Bang, but apparently they do. And so that's puzzling. The second question is dust. Is dust causing uh, some of these galaxies to appear more redshifted than they are? That can be sorted out by careful spectrographic analysis, and that's being done now. Nonetheless, uh, if you like to, put, uh, like to search for deep things, if you too are interested in extremes, uh, and you have access to even a small telescope of some kind or a friend's telescope, something in the perhaps 10 inch range, you might want to go out and try to find PGC 1634 plus 705 and Draco. And know that when you see that little 14.6 magnitude speck, and you will see it if it's a good night and you have at least a 10 inch, you're going to be seeing light that took 95 million centuries to reach your eye. Those photons traveled that long and you stopped them, covering 55 sextillion miles. So that's the deep universe and uh, happy hunting to all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. That was really interesting. Like, you know, you. I guess I never really think about it because time and distance to me and to a lot of people, I think, is yeah. so hard to comprehend. Um, you know, there's so little to compare it to. I mean, it's just very hard. So thank you. That is an excellent talk that yeah. shows how to compare that and exactly what the James Webb has done. I mean, we all know it's done an incredible job, but that well, is amazing. One thing, I uh, one thing I should add, too, is that these limits are all imposed by the fact that we can only look back in time. There are galaxies probably a trillion light years away. Uh, we'll never see those, but we can only look so far back in time. And so we're limited in how far we can see. And, and those are the limits we talked about tonight. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Scott, is there any questions anywhere? Uh, just, some, just some comments here. Um... Uh, you know, about how mind-blowing uh, this presentation <laughs> is. Uh, Connell Richards says, sounds like a wonderful talk. Chuck, your presentations on the deep universe are always fascinating. So thank you. People are glad it's Friday. They're glad that they're watching the Astronomical <laughs> League. Um, you know, it's a nice combo. And uh, um, so anyhow, uh, and Connell further mentions, I was hoping those numbers were up to date, all, all I need. Oh, okay, <laughs> he's just talking about observing, okay. So anyhow, but um, uh, you know, it is amazing that we are able to look back that far and to see that far away and you know, so, and uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around that you know, there's a point because the expanding expansion of the universe that uh, there's probably other galaxies out there, but we'll never actually be able to see them. So, don't you think that's what makes astronomy so interesting, though? I oh mean, yeah, we've always got something to learn, something new to look that's at. That's right. Something new to comprehend. I think that for <clears throat> me, that is one of the big draws here. We don't know everything. I mean, it changes so often. And just to be able to go outside with a small telescope or an eight or a 10 inch, whatever, and to be able to look and really think how far back in time you're looking at. You know, mm -hmm. when you talk to kids and you try to explain, you know, every time you look up, you're looking at light from way back, you know, however many years, whatever you're looking at. And that just really kind of still blows my mind as an adult, what we actually look at. And I think for me, that is one of the draws. One of the beauties of the universe. I, I have a question for Chuck, though. With gravitational lensing, would it be possible to to see past this uh, this wall? No, um, oh, there's no wall. Um, I mean, again, you know, this. I am using that metaphorically, yeah. but um, but uh, is it possible that something, let's say, thirteen point eight, fourteen? Something like that could be gravitationally lensed. 
no. to where we could detect it. First of all, to for anything to be seen by us, it has to be shining. Nothing yeah. was shining until 200 million years after the Big Bang. So we're not going to be able to see past the point where stars formed. Um, what's what's really remarkable is because we can only look back in time, uh, because light takes so long to get to us, can only mm -hmm. travel at the speed of light, we're not able to see the universe as it is. You know, if light traveled at an infinite speed, sure. <laughs> Uh, I mean, you look at a, like the Hubble Deep Field, about 98% of the galaxies in the Hubble Deep Field are so far away that anything happening there today, like a supernova, for example, will never be seen on Earth, no matter how many trillion years you wait. It will never get here. There's too much space expanding and accelerating its expansion, and there are horizons that prevent us from ever seeing that light. So most galaxies that you see in these deep images, and many of the galaxies I showed you tonight, uh, are already unreachable. It's like they're frozen. They're, the the last the photons that are have we will ever see from those galaxies are already on the way here. They left there a long time ago, but the ones leaving there now, no. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Well, thank you, Chuck. We sure thank do appreciate it. My pleasure. And, thank uh, you. And I guess if uh, I'd like to thank everybody that is here, David, thank you for joining us. We hope you're back February 10th. Uh, AL Live will be back February 10th at 7 p.m. Carol, it's always a pleasure to see you, too. And, and Chuck, too. I talk to you guys fairly often. <laughs> and Scott, thank you for everything yeah, you, you have done. Thank uh, you. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody out there watching. We really appreciate the fact you're out there. Hopefully you haven't got snow on the ground and clouds everywhere I look and everywhere I read. Everyone trying to observe is saying, oh, my gosh, this has been a terrible year. There and it's been, been terrible. Lot. Terry, there must have been lots of people buying telescopic equipment, though. Oh, hmm. there must have been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the reason for all that bad weather. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it has to be. It's <clears> just, <throat> it's like I haven't seen the stars and I don't know when. <laughs> I mean, it's really been nothing, a lot of snow, a lot of blowing snow, ice. Yeah, it's it's been nasty. I've so got... hopefully all of you out there are having better and clearer skies, warmer weather. Um, and please consider joining us at Alcon at the end of July, July 26th through the 30th, uh, 29th or 30th, I believe. Uh, the Saturday night will be our banquet, and that will be the wrap up. It'll be the last Saturday of July, and that will wrap up Alcon. We will be in Baton Rouge. So please consider joining us. Uh, check our website. If you're a member, watch the reflector, and we'll have some information on AL Live about that too as it gets closer. Watch for the website. I'm looking forward to the website. It's a very nice hotel really good rates so please join us there if you can we'd be glad to meet all of you so i think i'm going to wrap up unless somebody else has anything they'd like to say nope all thank right you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and thank you everybody for joining us we do appreciate it everyone have a great evening and a great weekend thanks good night good night good night well, uh, again, thanks everyone for tuning in to Astronomical League Live. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend uh, as well. We've got a little feature that we'll show you from the European Space Agency, who is uh, very much involved in the uh, sample return mission from the Perseverance um, uh, rovers. So let's let that roll and then we'll run the end credits here.
Thank you.